All right, welcome to Six Patterns. Uh, my name is Max. I'm Kevin. And we have another case for you today. Great. This case from a 46-year-old male. He has uh, some odd occupational exposure history working in the polyvinyl chloride or something like that. Um, but he presents uh, sort of subacutely. His imaging studies show bilateral, vaguely nodular infiltrates. Wow. Transbronchial biopsy doesn't show anything, so they end up with a surgical wedge biopsy. And here is his surgical wedge biopsy. So there was no reasonable explanation for the clinician to grab onto here, which is why this surgical biopsy was done. There also might have been a hope that because pathology is a mystery box, maybe the pathologist will come up with something that will help them attach the patient's presentation to his exposure in the workplace, because that's a whole nother area of debate about what things can you document exposure to with pathology that's credible. So the patient who was cleaning a bathroom and the, with chlorine and the chlorine spilled on the floor, single inhalation, and now they're sick two months later. Is it the chlorine or is it some other process? They happen to be ANCA positive, but 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 probably something that the pathologist has no business weighing in on one way or the other. Dangerously. Dangerously so if you choose to do it. So that's that's kind of our soft advice here is the occupational piece is a hard one to pin down. It's best done clinically. And by us only when we see something that's absolutely irrefutable. Like silicotic nodules. Right. Or like aspirated food. Or aspirated food. Or ferruginous bodies. Exactly. That's when you can say, yes, this pathology is related to this exposure. Right. But those, those are few and far between. Right. And causes of unexplained acute injury and acute presentation or subacute presentation, there are so many. Drug reaction, autoimmune disease, that exposure is one of the things to consider, but remember the other things when you're coming up with your differential. Enough said. Let's so, look at this case. So, if you can imagine this piece of tissue, if we were to do imaging studies on this piece of tissue, what might it look like? I would say it's vaguely nodule, irregular nodules yeah. of ground glass. Irregular nodules right. of ground glass, almost maybe some consolidation, right? Almost some complete whiteout in yeah. areas because this is pretty solid. I don't see a lot of airspace. Right, and, and you out, can in other places. Right, right. and out yeah. here we certainly see a lot of airspace. So this would be looking more like normal lung and then we'd have these irregular nodules. So this is an opportunity for you to think as a pathologist, this is what I'm seeing, what might this look like radiographically, and then make sure that jives with what the CT report says. Right. Because if it doesn't jive, then there might be a sampling problem going on, et cetera. So, so it, it's a good, it's a good uh, habit to get into to think about what this might look like radiographically. Yeah. Yeah. So we have these vague nodules that are a little bit irregular. And I think I can see alveolar spaces in the nodule, but they're not filled with air. Yes, indeed. So let's go to a few of these. Like we can go to this one right here. This is kind of a classic. Yeah, wow. Look at that. A Organization. Of yeah. fibroblastic yeah. tissue. Right. If you did a CD68. Positive. Weekly positive in here. If yep. you did a SMA, weekly positive yep. in here. Yeah. This is a classic polyp of organizing pneumonia. Now, we use the term organizing pneumonia in pathology because we were taught that the phases of bacterial pneumonia are identifiable. And one of them is the organizing phase or organizing pneumonia. That term clinically implies infection all of the time. So when you say the words organizing pneumonia, in public, in front of pulmonologists, they go, there's no way this is infection. And you say, I didn't mean infection. So I said oh, it was organizing pneumonia. Yeah. And that to us is not infection. And they say, the clinician says, I don't care what it is to you. I've got a patient and we're taking care of the patient clinically. What does it mean to us? So I avoid the term organizing pneumonia. I say airspace organization or just organization. It means the same to us pathologically. And it avoids this, which can it can be an unpleasant discussion in public when you say organizing pneumonia that is in true. front of clinicians. Although the challenge is, is that 
we're taught, this may be one of the few things we're taught in residency, that this polyp of immature fibroblastic tissue in the airspace is organizing pneumonia. Right. And so oftentimes, like maybe on a transbronch, that might be all you see. And you're like, yes, I can make a diagnosis. Organizing pneumonia, next case. <laughs> right? But be careful. Airspace organization always means something. It's the reparative phase of acute injury. Remember that. It's the reparative phase of acute injury. So I know where those polyps are. There was acute injury before. There's so no question. I'm you're like telling eight days me before. there was fibrin here before. Yep. yep. You're telling me there may have been hyaline membranes here before. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So this is organized. So what, what would be the things you might consider for a possibility for this type of organizing injury? Well, it is possible, conceivable, but this patient had a, a pneumococcal pneumonia uh, 10 days ago. But why would they do a surgical biopsy in that case? Remember, clinically, that's a pretty well-defined circumstance. The patient has infiltrates. The patient's got fever. The patient's sick, short of breath. They give antibiotics. They get a culture. The patient, patient gets better. They're not going to do a lung biopsy. So remember the circumstance you're dealing with. Put yourself in the clinical context. It will solve 60% of your problems. So we've so. got organizing... Um, Organizing acute lung injury here yeah, yeah. with polyps of organizing pneumonia. And maybe still some fibrin in here, or is that collagen? Mm -hmm. I think I think but that's that, one of the kickers here, yeah, actually, because yeah. not only do we have immature polyps of organization here, but this case shows these polyps, you see how it still has that polypoid architecture, right? These polyps of of dense collagenous tissue. Right. So Wiry, like, dense, pink. Collagen. So it's almost like you take the immature polyp and yeah. you complete the organization process by laying down mature collagen. And all of it's in the same field. So it's all in we the have same some area. polyps that look younger and some polyps that look older. Some of those wiry, fibrous polyps could be, I don't know, three or four weeks old. Yeah. Exactly. Or longer. Exactly. And actually, if we look around here, there's actually quite a bit of this fibrosing process here. These densely wow. fibrotic polyps of organizing pneumonia. So whatever is going on here is resulting in the deposition of collagen in a way that's not going to be good for lung function. Exactly. So I think we have to get to the source of this and try to solve this problem because this could go on to become something really bad if this is happening all over the lung. Patients are going to become restricted their oxygenation is going to go down. All that stuff is going to happen. So we're at a point now where we still see the active process. We have to figure out what it is so that they can possibly change the course for this patient. I get a sense there are a lot of crazy foamy macrophages here. There are a lot of foamy macrophages in this biopsy. So when I see that kind of foamy, let's go up and look a little higher if we can. That kind of foamy, I always think about metabolic injury. Drug. Drug reaction. Yeah. So what drug? Could this be something like polyvinyl chloride? I suppose it could be. Possible. Recurrent exposure. Patients become sensitized, gets an acute injury, which resolves, and then gets exposed again. I, I think these are possibilities. I would put in my discussion that a, a hypersensitivity or to drug or other exposure could produce this. Not hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Not classic hypersensitivity pneumonitis as we think of with the small non-necrotizing non poorly formed granulomas, but just a hypersensitivity, hypersensitivity immune reaction, which most medication reactions are not toxic, they're hypersensitivity type reactions. Right. So how would you sign this case out? So for, first, be before we go there, um, I, I think it's important to to talk about this entity called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Yeah. Because we're taught that the pathologic counterpart to the clinical term cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is this exactly, polyps of immature organizing tissue within airspaces. Right? But, but typically, if not classically, no dense fibrosis. Exactly. In cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, the clinical syndrome. Right. Why? Because they get better exactly. immediately with steroids. So that's the important thing to remember here because if you get a biopsy and it's got a bunch of organizing pneumonia and you say it's organizing pneumonia and the pulmonologist reads your report and says, oh, it's organizing pneumonia, I can't find a cause, this must be cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. When they go in and talk to the patient, they're going to be in a great mood because they're going to say, ah, 
we got the biopsy results. It's organizing pneumonia, which means you have cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which means we'll treat you with steroids and you're going to be feeling great here in a couple of weeks. Which is what happens in that condition for most patients. Right. The problem is two weeks later, you're going to get a call back from the pulmonologist saying, remember that cryptogenic organizing pneumonia you diagnosed? And you say, actually, I never called it I cryptogenic. Because I can't say that. Because pathologists can't use that term, actually. It's a clinical term because all avenues have, have to be explored, including, an obviously, clinical being the dominant one. So you say, I never said it was cryptogenic. And they'll say, yes, but we never found a cause, so it is. So it is. And you say, why are you calling me? And they say, because the patient's not, not only not getting better on steroid. Getting worse. They're getting worse. They're and we're thinking of rebiopsying. And you say, well. That's when you say, no, 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 no. Don't rebiopsy. Because probably the best way to sign this out from the get-go is to use the term fibrosing organizing pneumonia. Great term. Which is a, it is a great term. It clearly tells what's going on with the process. It's an organizing pneumonia, but it's a fibrosing organizing pneumonia. And the literature says that patients with this histology, fibrosing organizing pneumonia, may not even if it's cryptogenic, yeah. have a worse prognosis, develop right. progressive fibrosis, and do not respond to steroids. Right. And remember the other term that fibrosing is used for, especially in Europe, is cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis, which is our idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a scary term. So once you use the term fibrosing, you might actually catch the attention of people and say, are you talking about a scary fibrotic disease? And you say, yeah, actually, yeah. this is not going to act like a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia of the classic variety. Right. So as with any acute lung injury, we're going to go through our differential diagnosis looking for a variety of histologic features. We identified foamy macrophages here, raised the possibility of drug toxin exposure. He does have an exposure history at work. It could be that. It could be a, a wide variety of other things. The take home is we don't have anything definitive on this material to say exactly what the etiology is. But don't give up on mm, drugs or medication because... Remember, the patient might have had an exposure in the workplace, probably did, right. but that doesn't exclude other exposures. The patient's also taking amiodarone, for example. Which would be a perfect uh, setup for this. this for this design. kind of a pattern. So I, I think keep in mind, don't jump on the premature hypothesis of the history says polyvinyl chloride, therefore this must be, because you might actually miss the ca true cause, which, which was the which patient's is, medication, right. for example. Right. Great. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this case, and uh, don't forget to like and comment below, and we'll see you next time.